Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another one of CPDSO's weekly webinars. Uh, you're here with me, uh, Daniel, and Richard uh, from the British School of Etiquette today. Today, we're going to be looking at engaging with your emotional intelligence to change during these unprecedented times. So we're going to really be taking a deep dive into the concept of emotional intelligence and how you can not only understand it, but actually use it and apply it. Um, to create actual change uh, in your life. So we're going to be taking a deep dive into that today. Uh, so I'm just welcoming everyone uh, from wherever you are around the world, because uh, we are a global company. So I'm welcoming everyone from the US, from Africa, Asia, Middle East, Australia, and everywhere else in between. I thank you for joining us uh, at this time. It is August the 6th, 2020. And let's move on. So just a few housekeeping bits, guys, um, to go over. We are going to have the videos off uh, for today's webinar. So if you could uh, just switch off those videos for me. It is for GDPR purposes because this is going to be going up um, after the webinar uh, for um, consumption of anyone basically who wants to click into it. So um, I'm sure you don't want your faces all over YouTube. So if you can, uh, just switch off those videos for me. It will be much appreciated. Uh, that is the main rule of today, other than the chat, uh, which I'm about to go into right now. Uh, so just a few bits to go over with the chat. Um, any complaints? There, there probably won't be any complaints, but on the off chance that there is any complaints, please do email myself. Uh, I'm just going to put my email into the chat box right now for everyone. Uh, so you can just email me. Uh, there's my email in the chat. Email myself or you can directly uh, just put into the chat, which all the chat is coming to myself anyway. It's being filtered to me. Um, so you can put into the chat, just put a C in the beginning um, of any complaint that you do have. Put a C at the beginning of the complaint and then I'll be able to easily pick that out. Uh, also, um, no self-promotion. Like I said, the chat is going to be closed uh, today. Everything's going to be coming to me, but there may be times where we do open up the chat. Uh, so at those moments, please do not um, post any links or anything like that or any sell selling of services. Um, just a disclaimer, um, because if there is any of that, uh, you will be uh, released um, and kicked out of the, the meeting. Um, Lastly, obviously sharing questions, uh, sharing support and questions, uh, Pivotal, we are going to be running a question, um, a question, uh, a Q and A, sorry, at the end of the session. So please do get the questions into me during uh, the talk uh, so I can have them all ready and prepare to fire them off at Richard at the end of the conversation. So anything um, that is hot, um, in your mind that does come up during the talk, please do uh, just get it into that chat. And please do start off any question with a Q. So please put a Q at the beginning of all the questions. Again, it just helps me um, pick them out quickly um, when I get to, the, to, that fit, to that stage of the webinar. Again, guys, just a quick reminder for the people that have just come in. Um, we are having the videos off during this session. So if you could please just turn off the, those videos for me. Um, I think I see Charles Sykes. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Charles. <laughs> Can you just uh, get, get that video um, turned off for me? That would be much of a pleasure. Um, today, just going to be doing a few formalities quickly. So just a few uh, questionnaires, a couple polls that we run at the beginning of all of our webinars. Uh, just to see and get an understanding of who we have with us on today's webinar. So you should see it pop up on your screen just now. So we want to know, are you a member or a non-member of the CPD Standards Office? Uh, just put that in as fast as you can. And also, how many webinars have you been on so far with us? Daniel, Philip has joined us. Has Philip joined us as Charles? Yes, he's. Oh, wow. <laughs> I thought that was your younger brother. That's amazing. <laughs> I know, Charles, uh, Philip, we also have Philip with us today from the British School of Etiquette, too. 
who's going to be chipping in uh, with the questions for Richard. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm going to give it another five seconds on that poll. Five, four, three, two, and one. Thank you so much for um, sharing that information with us. I've uh, got one more poll uh, to come. So the next poll is really all about what topic um, you guys would like us to run in coming uh, webinars. So there you go. Just a quick one, please, guys, so we can jump right into the main content. So if you can just get that one answered for us as quick as possible, it's on your screens now. What topic do you want us to present on in the coming weeks? Mindset and planning, it, planning ahead. Presenting without the drama. Can you turn burnout working from home? Can you burn out working from home, sorry? How to use PPC advertising effectively and LinkedIn sales navigator walkthrough. So I'm gonna give you another five seconds on that one. Five, four, three, two, and one. Thank you very much for your participation. Just going to share those results with you, actually, so you can have a look at what's to come in the coming weeks. Uh, so we have a big um, win for mindset and planning ahead. So we will be uh, planning ahead with that one and getting that one scheduled in into the coming weeks for you all. Okay, so I just had to do a few things, letting, letting in a few more people into the room. Uh, just a quick CPDSO update, one minute of your time. Today we had a webinar previous to this one, so if there's any members uh, online right now, well, there are members online right now, we are going to be sending out the guidelines uh, for returning to face-to-face -to, -face to our members next week. And just want to say a big thank you for joining us on that previous webinar that we had and for all your engagement and feedback on that one. Thank you very much, guys, for that. <clears throat> Okay, so our time today, this is the breakdown. We're gonna have a 50 minutes webinar session, which is gonna be including Richard and Charles. I'm gonna keep saying Charles now because I'm looking at that name. It's actually Philip Sykes, uh, not Charles. Um, so yes, it's gonna be um, including Richard and Philip. Uh, and after the webinar, there are gonna be a uh, recording and slides available along with some other uh, materials as well provided by the British School of Etiquette. So those will be going out to everyone that has registered, um, regardless if you stay to the end or not. So if you do have something pressing and you do have to leave a little bit early, um, please know that you will be getting that information sent over to you. So here are the two gentlemen uh, looking as fresh-faced live on the webinar as they are in these beautiful pictures. Uh, they both come from the British School of Excellence, of Etiquette, sorry. Um, and Richard, we have, he's the consultant. So he's the consultant leading the charge on emotional in, intelligence uh, with the British School of Etiquette. And he's done an abundance of things uh, throughout his career. And he's worked with some really big companies over there in South Africa, uh, blue chip companies um, from Forbes to Barclays um, to First National Bank and more, the list goes on. Um, so he's done an amaz amazing work and he's really, I would say, dedicated his career now um, to focusing on emotional intelligence and behavioral change. So really using um, emotional intelligence as a way to drive and achieve uh, behavioral change. So we should be learning a lot today. So I hope you have your pens and paper at the ready. And then obviously we have the man himself, uh, Philip Sykes, uh, the founder of the British School of Etiquette. His roster, I could speak for days, um, he's, he's done work with royalty diplomat, diplomats, uh, celebrities, uh, corporate entities, and an abundance of work with, with the media, uh, such as BBC and other choice media channels as well. So without further ado, I'm going to put you into the more than capable hands of Richard and Philip. Daniel, thank you so much. Can you hear me clearly? Loud and clear, Philip. Excellent. What a great opportunity, Daniel, and, and huge uh, gratitude and thanks to CPD and to all the work that, uh, Daniel, you do along with your amazing team, Amanda and everybody. And once again, 
to be able to address you all. And thank you so much for making your time available to engage and to dial in with us because you're in for a real treat. And during these unprecedented times, we know the pressure to change and the way we work and the way we live our lives has, for most of us, created uncertainty and huge anxiety. And really the truth is that the change has become our sort of new normal. And in order to thrive in a world of change, we, re we really need to embrace and employ the right tactics in our lives to really succeed in going forward. And as Daniel very politely and kindly introduced me, my name is Philip from the British School of Etiquette. My parents confused the world by christening me as Philip, but yet I've always been called Philip. So Daniel, sorry for the curveball. Um, and as you all may know, I, I am the principal and the founder of the British School of Etiquette founded hugely on incredible passion and the belief and vision that we as human beings should connect and get to respect and know and learn about one another across the world. This is not about British etiquette leading the way on any level. So please, if that's in your brains, please take it out right now. And it really gives huge, huge uh, goosebumps for my body to introduce this amazing person who's going to be connecting with you shortly. I'm going to be asking Richard uh, some questions. We've got seven questions lined up for you this afternoon. But when I say it gives me goosebumps, because here is an individual who is not only passionate, but is a true, true master and, and at his craft. He's, he's a gentleman who's has spent more than 15, 20 years focusing on, on change uh, and performance in people. And one of the core key areas that Richard has absolutely every time come out of the, the starting blocks is that it's all about our emotional intelligence. And the reason why the British School of Etiquette is so focused and so passionate about EQ, excellence, emotional intelligence, which is the EQ element of it, their manners, the etiquette, the people, life skills, is because the head and the heart are connected. And I know for a fact that you can be the brightest individual out there, but oh boy, if you do not have the ability to connect and engage with people and put people at ease and build people and grow people, you are on a journey where could, you could land up maybe hitting some barricades, some ballards, or even hitting uh, into becoming a bit of a train smash. So without further ado, I'm going to be taking you on this journey along with Richard, and I'm going to be asking you some, uh, asking Rich some questions, and he's going to elaborate. And as Daniel said, please pen in hand, because there is going to be, there are going to be some wonderful golden nuggets. And not only that, you'll get the opportunity to engage in Q&A at the end, and obviously email in and find out what we can uh, sort of help you with on any level uh, that you may have any queries or ideas or if you want to sort of sort of take that journey and jump out that airplane and build your parachute on the way down we will support you on that so rich lovely to see you as always and i would love to sort of kick off with my first question to you um, it's obviously human nature for us to want things to stay the same because we get very comfortable within our routines and our lives and, and, and again in our relationships and beliefs. We get into this, what we would all call our comfort zone. Actually, in fact, more things change, the more we want them to try and stay the same. Um, and Rich, I'd love you to sort of please help me, you know, um, getting involved in understanding resisting change. Um, because it's a bit like practicing non-acceptance. Uh, when we do not accept the changes, you know, going on within our lives with our family and friends, colleagues and circumstances, there is a friction that develops within us. Rich, could you please elaborate and give us, give us some insight into that? Yes, certainly, Phil. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you all this afternoon. And thank you for the introduction, Daniel and Philip. Um, I think, you know, the question is, why is acceptance rather than resistance key to unlocking personal energy that you need to initiate and adapt to change? Well, before the pandemic hit us, um, we were in a state of rapid change in the world anyway. The rise of digitization, uh, including artificial intelligence and robotics, um, and existential threats like climate change. Uh, all of these were at a rapid state of, of development uh, prior to the pandemic hitting us. And then we had COVID-19 
uh, come around. And COVID-19 has caused extraordinary uh, pressure on all of us to change. And the thing is, um, when we are faced with change, we don't really like it. Most people resist change uh, rather than accept it and go with the flow. I'm going to try and share my screen because I have a few slides I'd like to share with you. Uh, let's just see. Daniel, if you could stop sharing so that I could share. It should automatically take over if you just start sharing your screen. Oh, okay. All right, great. Yeah, it's just booting up now, Richard. Okay, thank you. Do you, want right. to, do you want to make that into the presentation mode? Um, it should come up now. Yeah, there we go. All good. All right. Fantastic. Brilliant. So the, the thing is, when we don't accept change within ourselves, with our family and friends and colleagues, and the circumstances that we find us in, um, as Philip mentioned, it, it develops this kind of friction inside us and between us and people around us. What happens is because we are unhappy with having to accept change and we rather resist it, we can lash out at things that we don't accept and criticize others and complain about our circumstances to the point that this resistance actually disturbs our internal and external harmony. Now, when we start practicing acceptance, it's far easier to understand ourselves and the people that are around us for who they are, what they believe in, and the circumstances we're experiencing in the present moment. This present mind awareness, tolerance, and going with the flow of life releases a positive energy inside us and makes it far easier to adapt to and be flexible and even initiate change, which then enriches and encourages us to move forward in a world which we know is currently beset with change. Often, when we have to experience change, it causes within us uh, fearful and anxious emotions. Now, that anxiety that I think all of us fear, uh, feel, and particularly with the pandemic, um, is actually a low level form of fear that can either be temporary or in a worst case scenario like clinical depression uh, might require therapy and even medication. Now the common variety anxiety that most of us feel which comes and goes is often brought on by worry and this worry could have it, its roots in the change that we're having to experience. At this time, we could be experiencing change in many areas of our life, but I think particularly uh, in terms of our financial lives, uh, a lot of people have had to take a reduction in earnings uh, just so that the companies they work for can keep going. Um, we've had to experience what it's like living with our spouses on a sort of permanent basis because we're living at home and working from home. And, there's been a lot of pressure on our careers and on our work environment to adopt and change uh, to, for example, remote working. Now, when we experience this change and it causes worry, um, we might say to ourselves, have I, am I going to have enough money to survive in three months time? Um, Will I be good enough? Will I be able to change and meet the expectations of this new environment? And will I be able to be as effective remotely? Um, some of you that own businesses are possibly asking yourselves, um, how is this going to affect the culture of my organization or my business? And all these worries which 
enter into our consciousness in one form or another, um, if this worry becomes a habit, it will then cause a lot of anxiety within us. Now, chronic warriors think that they are actually solving their problems. But by chronic worrying, we're actually creating a psychological environment which stops us from thinking critically and creatively. And for allowing our brains to think in an agile way. Like other negative emotions, including anger, stress, anxiety, worry, cynicism, and pessimism, worry produces in our brains um, chemical inhibitors which stop the e that put up. The, those little squiggly things are brain cells. And the more we have negative emotions, the harder it is for our brain cells to communicate with one another and how more difficult it is for us to think critically and creatively. Now, the worrying cycle that we can get into, which causes anxiety, is like an endless loop of low-grade melodrama. And rather than being helpful, actually makes matters worse for us. Now, one of the best ways that I've learned to counteract the negative impact of chronic worrying is to catch the worry at its inception. When you hear the word or smell the smell or see the thing that triggers worry in you, before it escalates into full-blown anxiety, you need to challenge it with an alternative, plausible viewpoint. By doing this, we interrogate the worry objectively and providing this alternative viewpoint, we are able to step back from it the emotional quagmire of it. We're able to step back from it, think clearly, and start making decisions which allow us to move forward in an intelligent and constructive way. When we start practicing acceptance rather than resistance, we release the energy within us to cope with change and employ the right tactics and mindset required to quieten down our worrying thoughts. By reducing our feelings of anxiety, we're far more able to enjoy the journey that change presents to us. Now, make no error. Change is, is often difficult. Um, it often takes time to implement and is most often costly. Uh, in a lot of the consulting I do in the corporate environment, um, I often hear managers say, we're going to implement this change and everybody should just get on board because it's not that difficult. And they learn in the process of trying to initiate a change that it is actually expensive, it takes time, and there's definitely an emotional response to change. And what happens is people emotionally, initially when they are faced with change, will deny that the change even exists. Um, it's almost like the grief process. And once they've got through denying that the change exists, then they start saying, yes, okay, it's here. And they start objecting to it, which is a natural process. And if you're in a leadership position, when people start objecting to the change, you should be actually happy about it because you can allow them to bring their tears and fears and you can deal with those objections um, by selling the benefits of the change to them. But the key is listening to them. And then finally, they start to adapt to the change and eventually they commit to, to the change. And as we all know, um, because change is a constant, the other two constants are our values and the choices that we can make in our life. But change is constant. So what will happen is there will be a new change. And so we go through the cycle, the emotional cycle of change again. The key here is to reduce the time it takes you to go through the cycle of change and accept that you are going to have an emotional response to change. So when change comes, you feel the emotion, you accept the fact that you're in the denial phase, then you're going to object 
then you're going to adapt, and finally you're going to commit. Accept this process. Uh, we develop a positive mindset around change, and we're more likely to benefit because our minds are open to the opportunities that change brings with it. Fantastic, Rich. Um, I'm just going to come back onto the screen there, Phil, if I may. Sure. Um, you know, I mentioned, obviously, the, the pandemic. Um, and the reality for all of us is, yes, we were faced with all these changes. But the truth is, for everybody, if you look back, you have been more adaptable than you possibly thought you were. Um, yeah, and, you know, just to put it into perspective, I mean, more than 50% of the workforce in the world now is working remotely. Parents have had to learn to become tutors because their children are taking classes online. Uh, with social distancing, social interaction has been affected. And we are um, using masks when we travel on public transport and so on. Now, people who quickly accepted this new normal were able to adjust and adapt to the changes relatively quickly. Um, and what they did is they pivoted and they recreated their environments themselves and their processes and systems so that they could survive. Now, the more innovative and creative people were with this change, the more they thrived. Like most things in life, the way we respond to things depends on our willingness to adjust, adapt, be flexible and change ourselves. The benefits of doing so are immeasurable. And it's key, this transition from moving away from resistance to acceptance opens the door to increased happiness, purpose and fulfillment in your life. Yeah, that's rich. I know there's a huge amount of information in, in what you just shared with everyone. It was a short, short sort of question, but a, a, an pretty wonderful detailed answer and I think the one of the most dynamic powerful things is right now is that ability to be able to pivot and adopting uh, easier said than done but every cloud does have a silver lining and you cannot stay still right now you've got to be looking ahead and be very very proactive right now yeah. my other question that is I've teed up here is what is and why is it so important to know your strengths and know your weaknesses when we are faced with these changing landscapes and Great question, Phil. Um, yeah, look, it's so important in business and in life to understand that we are all uniquely made. Um, and everybody has uh, fantastic abilities and capacities. The key is to find those capacities and facilities. Um, and one of the ways we do it at the British School of Etiquette um, is to help people discover what their dominant personality is. Now, all of you on this webinar might have um, seen uh, models like the Myers-Briggs model or the DISC model or even the integrative Enneagram. We like to work with the HBDI or Herman Brain Dominance Instrument or what we call whole brain thinking. I'm going to pop up a screen um, just to share with you, which will give you a visual of what I'm talking about. One sec. Okay, so this is the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. And the important thing is to go back to what I mentioned about a dominant personality theory. Um, it doesn't mean that, let's say, you belong in one quadrant or two quadrants within this model. Um, it's just that one or two will be more dominant than the other parts. The truth is we operate within all four of these quadrants in our life. Um, it's just key to understand which one we are more dominant in. Some people are considered more left-brain thinkers and some are considered more right-brain thinkers. Um, so you have the left mode where you have the analyzer and organizer type of personality. And uh, it would be nice for all of you attending this webinar to sort of 
listen here and look and and help decide for yourself who you are because that's going to show you your strengths so the analyzer personality the way they like to communicate uh, the way they like to solve problems um, the way they respond under stress uh, is to focus on the facts um, and whenever they make a decision they will actually say have i got all the facts so <clears throat> they like to use critical thinking um, in any analysis that they make in a situation um, it has to be quantitative i.e it has to add up one plus one equals two a lot of them uh, enjoy numbers and are mathematical in their approach, approach to solving problems or thinking and uh, so very much an analytical type of mind personality the organizer personality in all the models that I mentioned previously are the more dominant type of personalities and they often land up in leadership positions um, they are a little bit more conservative um, they're very time orientated uh, plan orientated and everything must make sense in terms of things happening on time um, then we don't have enough time for me to actually go through in, in deep uh, detail into, into this model, which we do actually on one of our programs. Um, but just briefly, you have the explorer personality um, who says, I've got a great idea. The explorer personality likes a blank canvas and being given paintbrushes and to come up with designs that solve problems in alternative ways, as opposed to the analyzer or the organizer who might use deductive reasoning and facts and detail. Um, so they're imaginative, they're artistic, uh, rely a lot on their intuition, um, and love the combination and connectedness of different thoughts and aspects. Then you have the beautiful, sensual personality who's more emotionally connected uh, than the other three dominant personalities. Uh, they really care about people. Um, they want to, uh, they're more interested in what the team feels and the family feels than really what they feel. Um, so they also operate in intuition um, and tend to be a little bit more spiritual than the other personalities. Now, you might think I don't fit into one box or I might fit into one or two boxes, uh, which is great. I don't like to box people. Um, in fact, that's why we don't do a personality test. We take you through a process where you actually discover yourself. Um, but what you could have is you could have an explorer dominant secondary analyzer or an analyzer dominant secondary sensor, sensor dominant uh, secondary analyzer. In fact, there's six different combinations of personalities like the Myers-Briggs theory, um, which you could fall into. Why is this important? It's so important because when you understand your own personality and how you like to think and communicate and solve problems and make decisions, you will understand that operating in your dominant personality is a strength of yours. Um, and not only is it important for you on a personal level in terms of the work you like to choose, the way you like to do your work, the way you like to plan actually is also um, precipitated by your kind of personality. Uh, it's also interesting if you're a leader or a team leader in your work environment to know the kind of personalities that you're working with so that you can create collaborative and cohesive teams, project teams, where everybody is operating within their strength. The other uh, model that we use to uncover the strengths of the British School of Etiquette is Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences theory. Now, unlike IQ, which only focuses on five domains, um, Howard Gardner's theory looks at eight different types of intelligence that we actually are all endowed with, but uh, what is key is one, two, or three of these intelligences will be more dominant uh, in you as a person than the other ones. So for example, you might be endowed with high linguistic intelligence, like the great writers of this world, uh, T.S. Eliot springs to mind. Um, and 
people with high linguistic intelligence are good at word reasoning, uh, persuasion with words, and in today's world of digitization, it's a highly sought after strength uh, because more of us are reading um, information online than we ever have before. People with high logical mathematical intelligence like to arrive at a quantifiable answer through a process of sequential logic, um, whether it's time patterns or, 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 or numbers, and often will we'll pursue science, science uh, even law, um, yeah, any pursuit that requires logical reasoning. Uh, people with spatial intelligence um, often are, are creative and are involved in uh, pursuits like interior design or graphic design or architecture or space planning. Spatial intelligence is really being able to see and appreciate the different objects in space and how they interrelate with one another. People with high bodily kinesthetic intelligence are often very sporty um, and by, by its name, um, it's about physical pursuit. Um, so good hand-eye coordination, um, Babe Ruth, a great baseball player springs to mind. Um, <clears throat> when he was 15 years old, he was regarded just a hitter on his team. Um, but after slagging off the pitcher who was doing really badly, the coach said, okay, George, you go and pitch. And he was nervous, but when he landed on the pitching mound and he had the ball in his hand, he felt like he'd been there his whole life. And he landed up being an incredible pitcher as well as a hitter in baseball. Uh, so, you know, even if you're a crane operator or you work well with hand tools, it means you have high bodily kinesthetic intelligence. Musical intelligence, I'm reminded of Yehudi Menahun, who at the age, a great violin player at the age of three years old, um, was taken to an uh, orchestra uh, in San Francisco by his parents and decided after that experience at the age of three years old that he wanted a violin and he wanted uh, lessons, uh, which his parents provided. And by the age of 10 years old, he was an international performer. We don't all have to be international performers to have high musical intelligence, um, but it's very instructive if you have high musical intelligence to do something in your life which involves music. Um, interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence are the key intelligences that we develop and grow uh, in emotional intelligence. Interpersonal intelligence is about social awareness and relationship management in the way you understand and communicate and connect with other people in your life and in your businesses. Intrapersonal intelligence is really looking inward and how you understand uh, your model of life, your paradigms, uh, the way you self-manage your emotions and your lifestyle, um, and also your, how you develop your consciousness and your self-awareness. Um, and then, of course, naturalist intelligence. Most people with high naturalist intelligence are involved in uh, nature pursuits and causes around nature, um, the weather, the planets, the stars, etc. Okay, so when initiating change in your life or work, make sure that you're doing something that aligns with your strengths. When choosing people to work with, on projects, make sure that you delegate work to strength as well. Um, and capitalize on the diversity in your environment, but truly understand yourself so that you can use your strengths when you're faced with change um, more effectively. Excellent. Yeah, re re fantastic, Rich. I mean, for all of the, those of you out there who are really making a big effort to join us and listen in, uh, there's a lot of information going on here, but really when you can define um, and really pinpoint some your, your core strengths and, and skills and your what your weaknesses are and really start to take action on those, magic starts to happen. It's it's a known fact. And funny enough, it's something that we focus really on through our coaching programs uh, in Train the Trainer you know, if you, any of you are working with people, when you start to get to know how other people tick, boom, you're going to get incredible results. Thanks, Rich. Um, the next question I have, why is finding purpose and meaning in your life so important? 
uh, when we face with change or, or need to adapt to our new circumstances? Why is it, uh, is it so important? What, what is your... Yeah. You know, Phil, people have asked me, what does finding purpose mean? And uh, I will say, when you understand your unique talents and you pour all your love and energy into those unique talents, you will discover your purpose. Uh, purpose isn't something you find around the corner, it's found within you. Um, and as we've just discussed with personality and intelligences, you know, once you know who you are and you start, um, you, you start investing time in developing who you, you are and your strengths, you will also discover your purpose. Now, most people in businesses, they know what they do. In fact, they even know how they do it. Talks to your why. Great organizations or companies or individuals who achieve success truly understand why they do what they do. And they're good at selling that reason why to people who buy the solutions they create for the problems that they're solving in the world. Um, one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote a book called The Outliers, uh, he famously determined that in order to achieve mastery at something in your life, it will take you up to 10,000 hours. Now, if you break 10,000 hours down into a normal work week, let's say uh, we probably all work a few more hours more than this, but if you called it 40 hours a week um, and you focused entirely on that task or uh, career, it would take you about five years to achieve mastery in that particular subject. Um, but we know that a lot of stuff happens um, which, which will probably make that time even longer. Um, he also determined that when people achieve mastery, money actually starts chasing them and we stop chasing money um, because everybody wants to employ or use uh, a master in their field to help them solve their problems. So when we're faced with change and we're faced with making decisions, if your decisions are premised on your strengths, you will more than likely make the right decisions and not waste the opportunities that change bring with it. Uh, fantastic. And, and again, I would love to challenge every single one out there is to really give this some serious thought. This is such a beautiful opportunity. Really discover what is your why, why you do what you do. Because as, as, as Richard just said, you know, when you really love what you do and you know exactly why you do it, everything else just starts to fall into place. And write down your own purpose statement and create various uh, types of purpose statements and work out which one really best sort of connects with you and, and bounce it off other people that you know well and, and people you don't even know. It's, it's a really powerful thing to do. I've actually just recently rewritten my purpose statement and um, it's, yeah, it's just been, it's been fantastic. Richard, um, I suppose, why is having a good attitude so important uh, when you face with challenges, setbacks and obstacles? Well, Phil, attitude uh, and mindset. It, it was very interesting when Daniel did the poll earlier on in the webinar. Uh, mindset and forward planning was the most popular uh, requirement that came through from the members of uh, CPD. Um, so yes, attitude and mindset are actually so similar that they're synonymous. I want to pop up a slide just to, dis just to take you guys through uh, my next thought process. So when we talk about mindset, um, we talk about having a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Now, people with a fixed mindset, um, they want to look smart um, rather than be smart, unfortunately, and have a tendency to avoid the challenges that come their way. These are the people that don't get out of the denial stage in the four emotional responses to change. Um, they come across obstacles in their life, whether they're financial, relational, or work-wise, 
and they give up easily. Um, they don't see effort as a fruitful way uh, to change their lives. Um, so they do as little as possible to get by. And you'll find people with a fixed mindset, they don't like criticism, um, even if it's good feedback. Uh, they, they, they rather run away from criticism. Now, Carol Dweck, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck, who actually popularized um, this model of fixed versus growth mindset. She said that success in life is how you deal with failure. Failure is information. For example, this didn't work. I'm a problem solver. Let me try something else. Now, people with a growth mindset, um, they have a mindset of looking and learning. They're constantly interested uh, and curious as to how they can learn better ways of doing things. Um, and kudos to all the participants on this webinar because you are looking and learning and you're seeking out opportunities to improve yourselves. Um, when you develop a growth mindset, uh, you embrace challenges. You embrace this COVID-19 pandemic change challenge that we're all faced with. Um, and you see the opportunities that exist for you there to learn something new and develop yourself. Uh, they persist in the face of setbacks. You know, we've all heard about it. Uh, it's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's about how many times you get up. It's not a fallacy. It's true. And the more you get up, the more capable you become of handling more and more obstacles. Um, Phil, if you don't mind, I just want to go off, off script here and just share something that I learned from uh, M. Scott Peck, who wrote The, the, uh, uh, the Road Less Traveled. Um, this, this might shock some of you, but he said that life is like a box of matches. Every single match is a problem. And when you get to the end of your life, you light the final match. How's that? You see, because actually life is a series of problems. Uh, how we think about solving those problems is how well we're going to solve them. So it's the same with setbacks and challenges. And effort is really a, 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 a path to mastery. As I discussed the 10,000 hours, the more effort you put in, the more you will get out. And people with a growth mindset, whether they're in leadership or their knowledge workers or their professionals, um, they actually seek out criticism because every criticism is an opportunity learn, to learn. If you have the right emotional balance and makeup, you will enjoy receiving criticism and it's so important. <clears throat> so I just want to finish off this little section with uh, a saying uh, from, from Henry Ford, the guy who started Ford Motor Corporation. He said, whether you think you can or think you can't, either way you are right. Now, people with a growth mindset think that they can because they believe they can and they have the right mindset. Phil, I can't hear you. Your microphone is off. Rich, thank you for that. Sorry, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. And I'm, I'm always urging to, to sort of add, add to what you said. I just love what you're sharing with everyone. And it is so true and so powerful. Every single one of us have the opportunity and the ability to make changes. But you are the one that have got to do it. It's, it's very much the analogy I often share with, a huge, with all our students is, if you sit at the top of a hill with your mouth open, do you think a duck is going to fly into it? A duck will never fly into our mouths. We've got to go out there and get that duck ourselves. So, you know, it's unbelievable, this approach, shifting your mindset and really taking that opportunity and taking the chance. Richard, um, why should you use both critical and creative thinking to sort of overcome these challenges that we are faced with when we're dealing with this huge change? Thanks, Phil. I'm, I'm going to share a slide to illustrate... Um, my discussion around this question. <clears throat> so when we're dealing with change, we actually, essentially, we're solving problems. 
Um, and to process complex information and solve problems effectively, we need to toggle between our left and right brain hemispheres. Now, when we are born, um, as infants, we actually have an equal ability to operate in our left and right brain hemispheres. It's only as we get older that we start becoming more dominant in one or the other. And hence, uh, the personality theory that I, I just shared with you guys. Now, <clears throat> the left-hand side of the brain is more involved with uh, problem solving by logic and the analysis of facts. Whereas the right brain is more focused on the big picture and alternative or creative ways of solving problems. To be agile we, and to be balanced, we need to be able to develop both sides of our brain. And that's why we call our personality theory whole brain thinking, because it encourages you to develop all parts of your personality. So when we use one side of our brain more often, it puts a strain on the other side of our brain. Um, now, actually, for most of our movement, vision, and hearing, we use both sides of our brain. Um, and in this bilateral fashion, we are operating in a simultaneous way. Uh, both sides of our brain are switched on in our normal movement of our bodies. Um, now, we need to turn on each side of our brain if we want to learn faster, um, and act better when we are faced with stimuli. Um, there are various activities that you can do to uh, in increase the um, efficiency of your left brain hemisphere. Uh, things like, instead of using the GPS, remember somebody's address and find your way there. Uh, or remember uh, directions that you've been given. Um, stop using the calculator and start working out ratios and percentages and calculations in your head. Um, <clears throat> and remember phone numbers. Those kinds of things will develop your left brain hemisphere. Now, <clears throat> the left brain hemisphere, which is, is principally involved with vertical or logical thinking, um, is concerned with what is based on the facts at hand. When we think critically, we use deductive reasoning using facts to arrive at quantifiable answers. Now, according to Edward de Bono, and uh, some of you might have heard of Edward de Bono, who's regarded as the father of creative thinking, he says that creative or lateral thinking is more concerned with what might be than what is. Uh, so working across your normal path of logic Creative or lateral thinking can dislodge sensible and logical patterns of thought, revealing new and exciting ideas and scenarios. With lateral thinking, the key is to suspend logical or vertical thinking and free your mind to explore alternative viewpoints or perspectives. So whether you are left or right brain dominant, when you step out of your own conditioning and start to think differently, New questions and new viewpoints open up to you, which can help you to solve difficult problems, problems that we face when we're dealing with change. Um, so I just want to come off, this, off the slide there, Phil, and I just want to share a very interesting lateral thinking problem uh, that I worked out from a vision that Albert Einstein once had. So this is the, this is the problem. A man and an object are falling from a rooftop at the same time. The man looks across at the object in mid-air. From his point of view, how fast is the object moving? I paused there to give you a chance to think. <laughs> okay, so most people will say that the ball is moving at the same pace as the man, or as it would seem, from a front on viewer's perspective. Why is this so? It's because we normally observe and understand things from our habitual way of thinking or from our what is perspective. Now, if you had to think laterally, how would you observe this problem? Einstein observed this problem in his imagination, deducing that from the man's perspective, the ball and the man um, would seem to be still and moving simultaneously. 
So as the man's falling, looks at the ball, the ball looks still. So actually, the ball is still and moving simultaneously. From this, he developed his provocative idea, um, which became a theory that almost defied logic. And that is that time and space are not absolute, but relative. He was both a scientist and an imagineer. In fact, he said, imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. So my question to everybody today is, if anybody said to you that you are not creative, don't believe them. You have the capacity to access your creative brain. And if somebody says that you're more creative than you are logical, don't believe them. You can toggle between both hemispheres and develop both so that you can solve problems and think more creatively and critically uh, to handle change in your life. Super. I love, I love your answers there and I love the analogy. It really is huge food for thought in every sense of the word. My next yeah. question for you is, how does your self-talk or how does one self-talk impact our ability to initiate and manage change uh, in your life and, and in the way we work and in the way we sort of conduct our lives? Yeah. Well, Phil, you know, we have about 50,000 thoughts a day. How incredible is that? And each thought sets off a chemical reaction in our brains, which is felt in our bodies and expressed through our emotions, responses and behavior. Now, as we looked at the way brain cells um, communicate with one another earlier, negative, and, negative feelings like frustration, sadness, fear, anxiety, anger, stress, worry, all of those things uh, produce inhibiting chemicals in our brain which slow down the messages between our brain cells when we think. Um, I just want to pop up a slide which shows you the opposite. Okay, so when we experience positive emotions, and this is why EQ is so, so important to our agile thinking, flexibility and adaptability and ability to solve problems, because that's what we need to be able to do, especially now that we're faced with all these changes. Um, <clears throat> so when we experience positive emotions like self-love, compassion, optimism, happiness and joy, our brain produces neurotransmitters which speed up the messages between our brain cells and it makes it possible for us to think clearly, flexibly and even learn better. So when we're faced with change, we can either have negative self-talk or we can have positive self-talk and positive self-talk, that positive reassuring and reaffirming thoughts will not only help you to feel better, but will give your brain the neurotransmitters or what I like to call it the good fuel that you need to help you solve uh, the problems that change inevitably brings with it. Yeah, and, I, and, and again, just to share with everybody, one of, the, one of the things that I think we as human beings is we do let our negative thoughts uh, you know, help us run away with really digging ourselves into a deeper and darker hole. And I really would love to share with all of you that funny enough, 75 to 80% of our sort of thoughts that something bad or, or something wrong or something X, Y, and Z is going to happen actually never take place. So I would love you to all plant that seed in your brains and really start to understand that really worrying is not going to get you anywhere. You need to take things head on. And the other interesting thing, it's impossible to have a positive thought and a negative thought at the same time. So please really take, as Richard said, EQ for, I just love talking about this subject. So before I get carried away, Richard, my final question that I've prepared for you is, why is it so important to surround yourself with good people when you're faced with change? And, and I just love this question. Why is it so important? What, is the, what are the benefits? I think there's some obvious answers, but I know you're going to give us a little bit more flesh on the bone. Yeah, well, I'm watching the time and I'm trying to, to keep the time good. 
you know, Phil, change for all of us, um, or for most of us, is daunting and challenging. Um, having the right people in your corner is not only the intelligent thing to do, but it's also good to help you to solve problems. Um, one of my favorite authors, Napoleon Hill, who wrote the book Think and Grow Rich, uh, which is the basis for uh, The Secret, if anybody has read the book The Secret, um, he wrote the book in, in the early 1920s after studying more than 400 successful business people and industrialists. Um, he suggested that successful people um, uh, develop a brain's trust around them. And he suggests you surround yourself with men and women of a similar positive disposition to yourself, but with different capabilities that you can tap into yourself with should encourage you when you're down, complement the good ideas that you have, and offer alternative viewpoints to help you see things from other perspectives. Of course, being open to healthy criticism, as I mentioned earlier, by developing a growth mindset, are key to benefiting from a brand's trust. They say that you can judge a man by his friends, uh, my advice is surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, who are more evolved than you, and who have a genuine interest in your success and happiness in life. Super. I love it, love it. And I know one could really stretch this one out and, and, exa and, and pull this to pieces and put it back together again. And just, just, and I know we've gone through a lot of time already and you've been fantastic at answering those seven questions. Something I would love to share with every single one of you, you know, people often ask, well, what is this all about? You know, EQ, etiquette, manners, life skills, people skills, social intelligence, social etiquette. This all packaged together and packaged in the correct way. You just never know. One person, one opportunity can change your life for the rest of your life. So when you package yourself up into the most dynamic person that you can possibly be, and you go out there and you do unbelievable things, not only for yourself, but for everyone else that come into your life and beyond. Boom, you're gonna get the most phenomenal results through your life. I can promise you that right now. And not only that through your life, but you will be investing in the future of the people that come after us and the people that come after that. So together, I truly know for a fact that if we all do something, a random act of kindness every day, do something, go out there and go, our way and make things happen we may and will set the world in the right direction so richard thank you so much for your time and energy and preparation i know you prepared long and hard for this because you wanted to get the message across in this short space of time we had daniel i'm going to be handing back over to you to sort of orchestrate and take charge of the quick q a session please fantastic fantastic uh thank you guys um for that it was a brilliant uh, session. Thank you for all of the knowledge um, given, Richard, there. And thank you for the great and articulated questions uh, proposed, Philip, by yourself. We do have some more questions that have come through during the webinar. Um, if you can, everyone, please do send them more questions. Um, we do have a, a few uh, moments of the gentleman's time left uh, to fill up. So, first of all, it's just a general one. Um, Andre asks, Where can I find and access Herman Brand's? Uh, dominance theory? The Herman Brand Dominance Instrument, uh, if you just Google it, uh, you will be able to find out a lot of information about the HBBI model. Brilliant. So Google has the answers for sure, <laughs> uh, as, it, as, it, as it often does these days. Um, Molly has asked a really good question, um, what, which came through my mind as well um, when you up that diagram of the four um, pieces in the mind, the left brain and the right brain split into four. Uh, what's the differences between a speaker and a talker? Um, one was on the left and one was on the right. So is there any kind of real difference between the speaker and the talker? I think the talker is talking with another person. The speaker is somebody who stands up and gives a speech. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
Um, I've got another question here that came in through, from Graham. Um, he really wants to know the rationale, the rationale uh, between, behind the difference between using um, the phrase or terminology weakness as opposed to area of development. Um, so is there any rationale, is there any pros or cons between using weakness versus area of development? Thanks for that question. Um, you know, I'm of the belief that, like when we were at school, um, our weaknesses were exposed, our strengths were also exposed, and our teachers possibly tried to fix our weaknesses. When you become an adult, um, it's far more important to focus your energy, your time, uh, even your finances on developing your strengths and be less concerned with your weaknesses. Um, when we use the word development areas, um, I think we're sugarcoating uh, the truth. Um, now, in an organization or in a business, when you have everybody operating within their strength, each one is making up for the other one's weaknesses. And so everybody's operating within their strength and so they're operating within their purpose, their unique talents, and they're loving what they're doing. And therefore, they're going to do a great job. Brilliant. Brilliant. So just be more direct, really, with it. Brilliant. Um, another one. So you went through a few models um, in that. Uh, could you just quickly uh, run through them again? Um, for Sarah Watson. Uh, so she would just like you to give another quick run through of some of the model names um, that you mentioned. Yes, certainly. Uh, Sarah, thank you for your question. Um, we looked at the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument or Whole Brain Thinking, um, which we, we train and facilitate a, a program on at the British School of Etiquette. It's called Know Yourself, Know Others, uh, where we do a deep dive into HBDI and whole brand thinking to help people discover what their dominant type of personality is. We also look at the OCEAN model, O-C-E-A-N, um, to discover how open you are, um, how conscientious you are, extroverted you are, uh, agreeable you are, and if there is any neuroticism there. So we use those two models in, our, in, in, in Know Yourself, Know Others, our program at the British School of Etiquette. Uh, I touched on HBDI, or whole brain thinking, in this webinar. The other two models that uh, we looked at was the Howard Gardner uh, Multiple Intelligences Theory, um, which is used extensively in the United States of America uh, to help uh, children um, uncover what their dominant intelligence is. So um, they are not boxed in by an IQ test, which is often uh, very deflating, especially the score. Um, so <clears throat> Howard Gardner, uh, multiple intelligences theory. And then the fixed mindset versus uh, growth mindset, uh, initially designed and popularized as well by Dr. Carol Dweck. Yeah, thank you for that rundown. I hope you all had your pens ready for that one. Like I said, this is going to be up on uh, YouTube um, after this. So again, please do um, check out our YouTube channel. I'm going to be putting the link in the chat for that as well just now. Um, Andre asks, is asked uh, they've been working in the EI uh, area for 20 years and I've seen that organizations haven't really picked up on it just yet, it's still kind of floating under the radar as a bit of a pink and fluffy subject. Do you kind of, is there an explanation behind that? And is there a way forward? Yes, it's, it's, it's something that I talk about and I think about um, all the time, Andre, and thank you for that question. Excellent question. Um, I think, you know, according to the World Economic Forum, emotional intelligence um, is regarded as one of the top 15 skills required in the workplace today. And that was actually before the pandemic. 
interestingly enough, at the top of the list is creative thinking. Um, now, emotional intelligence accounts for 58% of the work that you do in a, in a work situation. Um, and it's also interesting that studies that have been done in America prove that people with high EQ on average at a certain level earn $29,000 more per annum than people with low EQ. Um, before the pandemic, the, the, the way leadership was sort of accepted in the world uh, was that the big boss persona still had a big role to play in the leadership of companies and organizations. What has happened with the pandemic? Um, people have experienced high levels of anxiety, uh, even depression. Um, and as we discussed today, a radical change, which was not only affect their personal life, also their physical life and their psychological life. Now, leaders who have high emotional intelligence, which is high self-awareness or conscientiousness, uh, consciousness, uh, high self-management of their emotions, and are more socially aware and better at building relationships, have proven to be far more effective and far more successful in this move across to remote working and in the face of the pandemic uh, that we are faced with. Um, I'm not the only academic uh, that is talking this language. Um, everybody at Harvard Business School is, is talking of the same hymn sheet. So EQ is no longer a, a want to have, it's an absolute need to have. Um, the beautiful thing about EQ is it can be learned. Um, it is something that can be developed with training and coaching and practice, uh, unlike IQ. Um, it is a far greater determinant of success in business, in relationships, in families, um, in education, um, than is IQ. So yes, it is becoming a far more popular uh, need and requirement for people um, to learn about, uh, to help them change their lives uh, for the better. So I love that question, Andre. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, we've got another two questions lined up just now um, before the end. But before that, just a couple of comments. Um, one from Victoria Getty. Uh, she just says that, you know, the content has been uh, amazing, Richard, and very thought provoking. And Stephen also follows that up with a very informative session um, from Richard and Philip. So thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for that. So Question from Helen, what practical steps can one take to accept change rather than resist it? So is there any, anything very practical uh, that one could do uh, to help them overcome? Yes, um, I, think, I think the first thing is to have the right mindset. Um, if you have the right mindset, you will be able to undertake um, solving the problems that change brings with it. Um, and to sort of reiterate a little bit about uh, what I said in my presentation is, so the first thing is you need to accept that the change is there. When you accept that, you remove the emotional barriers to dealing with the problems that that change brings. <clears throat> the second thing is to work out um, from a critical thinking point of view, what are the facts? What are the facts that are involved in this change? Um, they could be financial, they could be environmental, they could be physical. Um, and once you've worked out what the facts are, um, and a good way to do this actually is to take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle. And on the left-hand side, look at all the facts. And on the right-hand side, then not start looking at all the emotional aspects uh, that you have to deal with regarding the change. For example, the way people are going to emotionally respond to the change, how you feel about the change, um, and your, your, your tactics, um, if you're a leader, in how to implement or initiate that change. Uh, 
for example, if you follow the deny, object, uh, co uh, adapt, commit model that I shared with everybody, um, in the denial phase, uh, as a leader, you don't want to be pushing the change upon people. You want to sell it succinctly and clearly and allow it to sink in a little bit um, and allow them then to start objecting and let them bring their tears and fears. And then when somebody on the team starts adapting to the change, um, a key tactic as a leader is to find your first follower uh, because very often leadership is, is overblown. Um, the first follower is often the best leader uh, because by example, they give everybody else the permission to change. Uh, and then of course, you know, when you're in the adapt phase, uh, you, you lift up your first followers, you start showing um, your demonstrable uh, enthusiasm for the change that's going on. And once everybody's committed, uh, you start celebrating the success that that change brings to the organization or the business. Thank you so much for that, uh, Richard. Uh, we do have one final question, and it's a really simple one. It's just who, what is the title of the book uh, written by Napoleon Hill? Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich. There you go, Stephen. Uh, you can go ahead and Google that one now. Think and Grow Rich uh, by what, what Napoleon Hill. And it's the best book Richard has ever read. One of the best well how, how many books do you read in a, in a month, Richard? Or do you read multiple books in a month? Yeah, about four. four well, well, then that's, that's saying something. Uh, you should probably go purchase that one now. Then. Um, so just a quick one as well, guys. Uh, I'm going to put a, another link into the chat just now. Um, and that link is of the webinar that we previously ran uh, with the British Call of Etiquette um, with Philip there. And uh, please do go ahead and check out that one as well. Um, it was a great session too. And this session will be live on YouTube as well. So if you do, uh, please do just subscribe uh, to the channel and then you'll be able to get access to all of our content there. All of our webinars are posted up on that uh, YouTube channel. So please do feel free to subscribe. I just want to say a big thank you um, to Richard uh, and Charles. I'm going to keep calling you Charles now, Philip. <laughs> do, you, do you answer to Eva? I do. Oh, fantastic. All right, well, Richard and uh, Philip for joining us today. It was a great session. Um, we're getting loads of uh, appreciation in the chat just now from Sarah, Wendy, Angela, and the list goes on. So thank you again, uh, Richard and Charles. Do you have any final words for us? Accept the change. It's going to be much easier. Yeah. Accept the change. Accept so the change and, and put one foot in front of the other you know every journey starts with one foot and it's up to you at the end of the day to make that initiative to take the initiative and it's the person who goes out there wanting to change and wanting to help other people this is how we can really build grow ourselves and hopefully a bulletproof from the future maybe maybe not but the change is inevitable, it's happening. And as you all know, I think without scaremongering everybody, governments out there, people, medical people out there saying, the world is not gonna fall back into the way it was. Uh, definitely not in a hurry. So don't wait around, uh, move forward with your lives and start to plan and create some unbelievable opportunities for yourselves. Engage with dynamic, powerful people, study, read, uh, and, and just keep building yourselves. Fantastic. Um, yeah, please do obviously bear in mind that there is more than one kind of um, intelligence and emotional intelligence is definitely one that is, it does trigger change in an individual because we are highly emotional beings. So please do just bear that in mind and use the information shared by Richard today. Just want to say a big thank you to Augustine sharing some love in the comments. Paul, and Andre, um, Victoria, Nikki, thank you all so much uh, for today. And please do Join us again next week. Uh, we're going to have another webinar live for you on Thursday at 2 p.m. We will be sharing this one uh, to your emails directly. It will have the link um, to the webinar and also the slides used. Uh, so please do be on the lookout for those early next week. Uh, thank you again from me, uh, from Richard and Philip for joining us today.
Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, CPD. Thank you. Uh, bye, everyone.